Your life is critically important as a testimony to God, to the name of God, and to the teaching of God's Word. Well, good morning. Is it good to be the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. So this morning we are in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. What I want to talk to you about this morning is warnings for your Christian witness. Warnings for your Christian witness. This passage this morning is about honor. It's about honor. In fact, the Apostle Paul at the beginning of 1 Timothy 5 began speaking about honor. This is now the third section in which he is addressing that subject. In the first section, he addressed honor as it, as it pertains to widows. You honor those who are truly widows in your church by giving them support financially. And he gives all the regulations and rules for doing that. And then in the very next passage in 1 Timothy 5, beginning in verse 17, he talks about honor not of widows, but honor of elders. Honor in the sense not of financial support in a social security sense, but honor in the sense of compensation. You show honor to your elders, especially elders who labor hard in the preaching and teaching, those who rule well, he says they are worthy of double pay, double honorarium. But this section is not about widows. This section is not about elders. This section this morning is about slaves. It's about slaves. We are all slaves of Christ. We are all servants of Christ. However, Paul is talking about actual slaves. People who served as slaves there in the first century in the Roman Empire. The ESV in the translation of that word, douloi, doulos, they translate it as bondservant. I think that that word should rightly be translated as slave. It means nothing less than that. Not just a household servant, not just a bondservant, this is a slave. A person occupying the lowest the lowest status in all of society, the lowest station in society. And Paul's going to make some comments here about these these people occupying the lowest station of society, Christians who occupy that lowest station, and how their behavior in that station actually is a significant public witness to God and to the whole of Christian doctrine. Now, if you think that this does not pertain to you, I want you to stay tuned because you'll see that it is absolutely appropriate to apply these principles to every one of us, and indeed they are applicable to every single one of us. Let me summarize the way, what I want to say to you this morning in this one sentence, and I think you'll see it. As a Christian, key phrase there, As a Christian, your work and the way you act is a public witness to the name of God and the whole of Christian doctrine. As a Christian, could y'all turn me down just a little bit? I think I'm echoing and hurting people's ears. As a Christian, your work and the way you act, notice I did not put, is sometimes or will become or can be. No. Your work and the way you act is a public witness. The question is not whether it is or is not a public testimony to the character of God and to the truth of His Word. The question is whether or not you are bearing true or false witness. You're bearing witness. You name the name of God by calling yourself a Christian. You say that you believe in Christian doctrine by bearing the name Christian. Are you bearing false witness in the workplace? Are you calling yourself a Christian and then not living like it? Are you calling yourself a Christian and not acting like it? Because when you, when you don't actually act like a Christian, you don't fulfill the commands that God has given you, you bear false witness on the name of God, and you bear false witness 
of Christian doctrine. This is absolutely applicable to all of us. I want to remind you of Paul's purpose in 1 Timothy. Paul wants us to act right. Paul wants the church to know how to behave. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. I hope to come to you soon. But I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. We are His children, are we not? We are God's household. When you go out in public... And you have your children with you. If those children act properly, it's a good reflection on you, isn't it? It says that you're a good parent. It says that you're teaching the right things. But may it never be that we go out in public and our children misbehave. That's also a reflection on us, isn't it? It could say... It could mean you're a bad parent. You're a bad person. It could mean you're teaching the wrong things. How does that feel? Does that feel good for anybody? But we are the household of God. We are His children. And when we go out in public and we misbehave, what are we telling people to believe about God? We're telling people to believe that He's a bad God. We're telling people to believe that God puts up with it. And we're telling people that God really isn't too serious about what He says in His Word. He's one of those parents that just sweeps it under the rug and plays a mean game, but doesn't actually have any bite to the bark. That's what we're saying about God when we misbehave in public. He says, I want you to know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. I want to remind you of the words of our Lord, Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16. Jesus says this of us. He says, you are, you, you the church, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, Jesus says to his children, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When we looked at that a number of months ago, I told you, the point of that verse is this. We ought to be working such a way in the world that when people see those good works, it moves them to become worshipers. That's what Jesus is saying. So that they see the way you act. They believe your God. They believe his truth. And they come to admire your God. And they come to worship your God. Jesus says, carry yourself that way. Paul doesn't put it as positively as Jesus did in Matthew 5. Jesus says, we're the light of the world. Paul says, don't act like darkness. In verse 1 of this passage, we're just two sections two verses. In verse 1, you see commands for Christian bond servants. You could say slaves. Commands for Christian bond servants. You say, well, I'm not a slave of anybody. I'm a slave of Jesus, but I'm free. I'm an American. Keep telling yourself that. Verse 2, commands for Christians with a believing master. Commands for Christians with a believing master. I, I think we need to dig into that one here in just a little bit. What happens if your boss at work is a Christian? What happens about your coworkers if they're Christians? How do you treat them? Let's look at these commands for Christian bond servants. And in here, I'm going to give you two warnings, two warnings that are intimately related to one another. Let's look at verse one. He says, let all, when you see let, it's most often an imperative, a command. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants, douloi, slaves, regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. So that, it's a henna clause, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled, may not be blasphemed. Now he's speaking to slaves, is he not? Let all who are under a yoke 
as slaves. Regard their own masters worthy of all honor. He's talking about slaves. Notice that the Apostle Paul does not come out and say, we need to just abolish slavery. He, he doesn't come out with any intention on abolishing the system of our world. You live in this world. Paul says, this is how you need to act. You see, we live in a world with corrupt, evil systems. This passage in no way is an affirmation of chattel slavery. It is in no way an affirmation of racial slavery. But Paul does here recognize that slavery is part of this fallen, corrupt world. And you know God's remedy for a fallen, corrupt world? God sent His Son Jesus into the world to die for the sins of the world. And God calls every man, woman, and child to confess Jesus as Lord and to believe on Him for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of everlasting life. In the kingdom of God, there will be no slavery. We are not yet in the kingdom of God. That is God's plan for social justice. In the kingdom of God, every wrong will be righted and every right will be rewarded. But in the meantime, while we live in this world, we need to learn how to operate here in the way that's pleasing to God. So Paul says, let all who are under a yoke as slaves, as bond servants, yoke is it's quite literally a bar, a piece of wood that goes across the back of a cow. And on that bar are chains, leather straps, and it binds that cow to that piece of wood. And in the middle of that wood, there's a rope. There are chains connected to it. And those chains go to the master, the one who's driving the oxen. And whichever way that the, the leader of those oxen's, oxen pulls the chains, that's the way that the oxen go. Why? Because the oxen is a slave. The oxen is a servant. Paul recognizes there are people in stations in this life that are in that kind of a relationship with their boss. There are people who have served in this world as slaves. As horrible of a station of life as that might be, it does not disregard the reality that people have and people do still in this life serve as slaves. They're under the yoke as bond servants, treated no differently than animals. Can you imagine a lower station in society? Is there a lower station in society than a slave? A human being who's treated like an animal. We need to answer that question. There is no lower station in society than the station that Paul is addressing. Think of the world that Paul lived in. Paul didn't live in America. Paul lived in the Roman Empire. Listen to this. Listen to these stats. In the first century BC, just in Italy, just in Italy, historians reasonably, agreeably estimate that 30 to 40 percent of the entire population of Italy were slaves. 30 to 40 percent of the entire population. In the Roman Empire abroad, somewhere between 17 and 20 percent of the whole world was slaves. This is a very real institution when Paul is writing this letter. It's still a real institution in our day. He is writing to the people who occupy the lowest possible station in society, which is going to shock you about what he says next. He says, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own despotas, their own lords, their despots, their own lords, their masters, as what? as worthy of all honor. Worthy of all honor. Can you imagine that? 
If you were enslaved to another human being who treated you no differently than an animal, and you're required to treat that master with all honor, let me ask you, is that master worthy? Does Paul say that? He doesn't say they are worthy of all honor. He says, treat them, regard them as though they were. Regard them as worthy of all honor. Oh, well, it's easy to honor widows who are truly widows. It's easy to show honor to elders in the church. But what about showing honor to people who would treat us like an animal? The Apostle Paul does address slavery, but again, his intention in the New Testament is not to abolish the institution of slavery. It's to teach Christians how to live rightly before God in a fallen world. The book of Philemon, I don't know if you have ever read that. It's a very short read. It's just one chapter. In the letter of Philemon, that is actually a letter to a slave owner. The letter is to Philemon, who owns a slave named Onesimus. And in, in the letter to Philemon, Paul tells, Paul tells this slave owner, he says, Onesimus, your slave, has run away from you. He ran away from you, and he ran to me. And when he ran to me, I won him to Jesus. I've discipled him. And now, guess what? I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending him back to you, and I've told him he needs to serve you well. And he says, now, Philemon, I'm telling you, as a friend, as a brother, don't make me come in discipline as an apostle. I'm telling you, you're a Christian. You need to receive him back. Receive him back, but don't you treat him like a slave. He is still to serve you, but you treat him like a brother. Listen to this, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 through 9, teaching us how to operate in a fallen world. Bond servants, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would obey Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. The implication there is that Christ is returning soon. And he is coming to enact the judgment of God the Father. God the Father shows no partiality. So however you treat anyone in this world, you better treat them so that you receive God's approval. So if you're over somebody, you better treat them rightly. If you are under somebody in power, you better respect them rightly. Because our Father is judging. Colossians 4.1, Masters, Treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. He is telling, Paul is, let, let all who are under the yoke as bond servants regard their masters as worthy of all honor, the lowest station possible in life. He says, regard your master as worthy of all honor. Now here's the kicker. Why? Why, and why does this matter to us? Listen to the second part of this sentence, the clause, the grounds for the command. He says, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. What is the name of God? The name of God is a metonymic term. It's talking about God's person, his character, his works. You bear the name of God. You call yourself a Christian. You were born in the image of God. You bear the name of Christ. You represent him. You ought to look like your father. And you know what people do? People assume that you look like your father, whether you do or not, because you claim that he's your daddy. You claim that he's Abba, Father, who helps you in all your suffering. 
You claim him as father. People assume that you look like him. So when they look at you, they think they see the character of God. When you don't act like God, what's the character that they see? They see poor character, and they assume God has poor character. They assume God must be like you if you claim to be like him. He says, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching, the didaskaleia, the, the whole of Christian doctrine is what he's talking about. When you claim to be a Christian, you're saying you believe what? The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me, right? I believe I stand upon the Word of God. I believe the Bible. And so, however you act in this world, if you act poorly, what do you think people think this book teaches? They think this book teaches you to act poorly because you say you believe it, and that's what you do. They're not going to take the time to read this. They're just taking the time to read you. You may be the only Bible some people encounter. How do you represent it? This is inerrant, and yet we're full of sin. We're commanded to be holy as God is holy. Now, you have, Paul, you're writing this to slaves, though. Now let's make a connection. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled, may not be blasphemed. He says, you slaves occupy the lowest station possible in all of society, and yet your life is consequential when it comes to the name of God and the teaching of God's Word. People will look at the life of a slave and make a decision about God and his word. You say, well, I'm not a slave. I don't occupy that station. I occupy a much higher station than that. I occupy the station of a free man. How much more so do people look at you? If they're willing to look at the lowest in society and make a judgment about God, then would they not also look at anyone higher than that and make even more of a severe judgment about God. Yes, they would. You're being watched. You're being watched. I'm being watched. People are watching us because they want to know about God. People are watching us because they want to know about this Bible that we read. They may not be watching with the intent on believing. They may only be watching with the intent of blaspheming God, of reviling Him of cursing him. And they say, oh, I, I see the way you act, brother. And you, you say you believe in God. I can't believe in that God. There's no way I'd ever act like that God. So because of your actions, they curse your God. Oh, I see you, I see you reading your Bible here at work. I see you wearing that T-shirt or that WWJD bracelet. I see you with that Bible verse on your wall in your office. I hear you humming those Christian tunes. I also hear you saying things that you ought not say. So is God okay with me just doing whatever I want? Boy, why do I have to become a Christian to do whatever I want? Why don't I just do whatever I want? And they revile the teaching. Your God's not worth it. Your teaching's not worth it. If you look like God, I don't want to look like Him. If that's what your God teaches, I don't want to follow that either. You're no different than anybody else. Your life is critically important as a testimony to God, to the name of God, and to the teaching of God's Word. So let me give you two warnings here. Warning number one, they both go hand in hand. In whatever station you are in. As many people as we have in this room, that's as many stations in life. You may think you're a lowly person. You may think you're a high and lifted up person. If you do, then we think too much of ourselves. In whatever station you are in, you must not bring contempt on the name of God. This is what contempt is. 
Contempt is a state of disgrace, ridicule, shame, disfavor, discredit, disrepute. In whatever station you are in, you must not bring contempt on the name of God. You may be the only Bible a person will ever read before they come to the knowledge of God. And if you are bearing false witness of the character of God, beware. If you're bearing false witness to the, the truth of God's Word, beware. And our, li- our lives, the way we live, the way we act in public, is absolutely important. How, 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 how rewarding, how encouraging is it on the other end of that, though? Let your light shine before others so that they see your good works, they become worshipers. They give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I, I, I know you. I know you well at this point. That's the way that we all want to live. We all want to live in, in such a way that people see Jesus in us. That people see us living out the truth. And when they encounter us, they encounter the love of God. They encounter the grace of God. They feel the comfort of God's Holy Spirit. They feel the encouragement that only comes from a God who loves them that would send His Son Jesus to die for them. That's who we want to be. Paul gives us a stern word here. So whatever station of life that you occupy, don't bring contempt on the name of God. Understand that as a Christian, you are bearing your Father's name. You're claiming to bear His image. Indeed, you do bear His image. The question is, are you bearing false witness of who He is? The second warning here for your Christian witness is much like the first. In whatever station you are in, you must not bring contempt on Christian doctrine. Don't bring contempt on Christian doctrine. Let no unwholesome talk proceed out of your mouth. When we say we believe that. But, but what, about, what about at work? What about when somebody gets us riled up? What comes out? Is it the truth of God's Word or is it this unwholesome talk? Are we bearing false witness to the truth of God's Word? Be, be, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. How are we carrying ourselves? Are we saying, oh, well, that verse, it's in there, but I just... You know, there are a few verses that even the unbelieving world has memorized. And they're watching to see if we're actually going to keep that. I guarantee you, almost every person in the unbelieving world knows you shall not lie. And what happens when we name the name of Jesus and yet we're untruthful? Well, I softened it right there, didn't I? not untruthful. What happens if we bear the name of Jesus and we lie? We're liars. What are we saying? I say I believe this, but I really don't. And people say, yeah, I don't need to believe it either. And they revile the Word of God. They blaspheme the Word of God. You know, we, we, we read the passage in 1 Timothy 3 about pastors being above reproach, about deacons being dignified, And about how if a pastor falls, well, people are looking at that pastor. And if a pastor falls, man, there's going to be a lot of collateral damage. A pastor must be above reproach, above contempt. Paul goes one step further here, and he says, a slave must be above reproach. Pastors, slaves, everyone Everyone who names the name of Jesus is bearing witness to the character of God and to the whole of Christian doctrine. So friends, let's be careful. Let's be very careful of the way we act. Let's be very careful of the way we represent God. Maybe we need to pray little things like this. There's a, a, a young man that I've been working with, been discipling him, and that young man's having difficulty Difficulty just controlling his mouth. Saying things that bring dishonor to God. And I say, this young man, I say, when I was little, I had a really hard time with this. 
He used to say things that were not honoring to God. I, I still remember. May God forgive me. May my classmates who knew me back in the fourth grade, if they watch this, may they forgive me. But I remember back in the fourth grade, fifth grade, my mouth was terrible. My mouth was terrible. And, and I, I remember God convicting me so deeply. And I, I'm not making a joke of this. I just did it. I, I felt so convicted by God that I was bearing false witness to his name. I went, I went home and I did the only thing I knew to do. Two things. I prayed. I said, God, clean my mouth out. And then I, I went in the bathroom and I took a bite of soap. God, clean my mouth. Because my mouth is filthy. And that's what I, ate. I always used to hear. Boy, I'm going to have to wash your mouth out with a bar of soap. I thought, well, that's the way God's going to cleanse it. I'm just a child at that point. But you know what? God heard my prayer. God gave me control. Still, I have to pray about it. Still not perfect. But you know what? People look at us. When we claim to be a Christian, we claim to bear the, the, the name of Jesus, we're bearing witness to the, the, the character of God. We're bearing witness to the Word of God. Friends, we've got to be careful. Not, not about everything in our life. The way we dress, the way we talk, the way we treat people. If we're being kind, if we're being patient, if we're being slow to anger, if we're abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what God expects of us. May the Lord give us strength. When we close here in a little bit, I want all of us to pray for that. That God would give us strength. That God, God would clean our mouth, to clean our eyes, to clean our hearts. I'm not telling you to go eat soap, but I'm just saying we need to pray that God would, God would help us to accurately represent Him. Listen to this, 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, you're just temporary residents here, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify your God. Glorify God on the day of visitation. Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. May the Lord keep us in whatever station we are in from bringing contempt on His name, or on Christian doctrine, on the Word of God. So those are commands for Christian bond servants. Now listen to this. Commands for Christians with a believing master. Commands for Christians with a believing master. What would be the temptation for Onesimus, the slave, who had become a Christian, and he sent back to Philemon, the Christian slave owner? What would be the temptation for Onesimus? He says, well, the Apostle Paul says we are all one in the family of God. We sang in the prison, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And so now, Philemon, I'm not your slave. Who are you to tell me what to do? You're a brother. You're a brother in Christ. Who are you to tell me what to do? Let me ask you, does being part of the family of God do away with authority structure? Absolutely not. Does being part of the family of God do away with the command to show honor? No. In fact, it increases it. It increases it. Listen to this. Verse 2, 1 Timothy 6. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. 
Don't disrespect your boss because they're a Christian. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and agape toy. They are beloved. As you're in the workplace and you have an unbelieving master, regard them with all honor, even though they don't deserve it. Regard them with all honor. Why? Because you're representing God and you're representing His Word. But if you're in a situation where you have a believer as a master, guess what? Paul says, they are worthy of your honor. The unbelieving person, they're not worthy of your honor. The believing person, they are worthy of your honor. You know why? Because they believe the truth too. And they're your beloved. They're your brother and sister in Christ. So it, it, it only increases the need for us to show more and more honor. In other words, is there any situation in life where we are to show, be dishonorable towards people? Nope. Is there a work situation that we could find ourselves in where we should be dishonorable towards people? Nope. Not an unbeliever, because you're bearing witness to God's character and His Word. And not to a believer, because guess what? They believe the same thing you do, and they're your beloved. They're your beloved brother and sister. You may be facing difficult work situations. I don't imagine any of us have ever faced difficult work situations that even compare to the difficult work situations that a first century Roman slave faced. We have an embarrassment of riches, friends. A first century slave was treated no better than an animal. In fact, there were animals that were treated better than some slaves. So whatever situation you find yourself in, and I'm not saying that we don't go through difficult situations. I've been in those too. But whatever situation you're in, realize you represent Jesus. You represent God our Father. You represent His Word. Do whatever you can to shine that light so that people see the way you live and they become worshipers of God too. And whatever you've got to do, avoid bringing contempt on the name of God and on His Word. Jesus, Jesus went through much more difficult things than we did. When we suffer, we deserve it. In, in, in one grand sense, when we suffer, we deserve it. If God gave us what we deserved, we would be in hell. So in one sense, we definitely deserve suffering. Jesus, on the other hand, did not deserve suffering. He went through that suffering so that we could be set free from our sins, so that we would not receive the judgment of God. But Jesus also went through suffering, Peter tells us, to give us an example of how to do that. So listen to the example of Jesus as we come to a close. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. He says, Servants, slaves, be subject to your despotes, your lords, your masters, with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows for suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin, you are beaten for it and you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. To what? To suffering. For to suffering you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Okay, so how do I act at work in this difficult situation? How, how do I act in life in this difficult situation? Verse 22, don't do anything wrong. Jesus, he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. Don't be a liar. When he was reviled, they cussed him. They cursed him. When he was reviled, he didn't cuss them back. He didn't revile them in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to God, to him who judges justly. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree 
that we might die to sin. What sin? The sin of rebellion, the sin of cussing people, the sin of lying, the sin of doing wrong. What does he say? He said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to all those sins and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Healed of what? The sickness of rebellion and ugliness. You've been healed of it. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's who we are, friends. What an example. When Jesus had a hard time at work, never cussed anybody. He never threatened anybody. He never fought back and made enemies like that. He said, God, you have me. May your will be done. Father, if there's any way that this cup should pass from me, may it be so. Nevertheless, not what I will, but you will be done. And he entrusted himself to God. Aren't you glad? And Jesus entrusted himself to God. He had more than a hard day or a hard year at work. Jesus suffered for sins he never committed. So Peter says this, if you suffer at work, if you suffer in your life, it better not be because of sins you commit. He committed no wrong, neither was there any deceit found in his mouth. Friends, let's be holy as Christ is holy. Let's follow his example in suffering. And when people see, when people see that we are willing to suffer for the truth, you know what that does for the truth? It tells people that that must be worth suffering for. It tells people that must be worth believing and when people see you enduring hardship because of the name of God, what do they say? The name of God must be worth suffering for. There's a lot of things that I enjoy in this life, but there's not a lot of things in this life that I'd suffer for. Boy, but if I'd lay down my life for the name of Christ, He must be worth dying for. Friends, and if He's worth dying for, He's worth living for. So let's watch our mouth. Let's watch our actions. Let's understand that our, our public witness bears testimony to the name of God and the Word of God. We've all messed up. We've all said and done things we shouldn't do. That's the beauty of the gospel, though. That God takes people who will admit that and ask Him, say, God... Because of your son Jesus dying for my sins, I pray that you would forgive me of those sins. Treat me as your own child. Help me to act the way that you want me to act. Help me to bear your name properly in this world. That's what it means to become a Christian. For God to forgive you of your sins and for you to begin following him in obedience as a servant. Loving his commands, loving him, living for him. Just a few warnings for your Christian witness. Would you pray with me?